<laughs> we are I so love excited. talking with you guys. I'm so excited. Oh. We are excited too. Um, today, mm -hmm. you can't see my heart as well. Yeah. It's there. Um, today, <laughs> we have Lynn Weinman, who's president and chief strategist, Ooh. which means she's got a really big brain and thinks about things mm -hmm. deeply, um, of Kid Glove, which is an awesome B Corp marketing company. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about that because she will do that better than we can. Um, and we're super mm. passionate about having her. So welcome. Yay. Lynn. Welcome, Lynn. Thank All right. You. Yay. Can I take you with me everywhere? I love that introduction. <laughs> Like really I just good would, Lynn and Gail and Bruce, yeah, everybody. Yes. We'll be your flash mob. Yes. I love it. Well, thank you guys. I have been a fan of this podcast since you launched it. And when you reached out and asked me to be a guest, what did it take me 12 seconds to respond with an all yeah. caps and six yeah. exclamation points? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that's something you should know about me. Even before I introduce myself, I'm going to tell you that uh, sometimes in my industry, copywriters have this rule that you get six exclamation points to use in your entire lifetime. But I, on the other hand, feel sorry for all of the sentences that do not have exclamation points. I think mm -hmm. they should all that have poor them, little so. sentence. It's really sad. Yeah, I resemble yeah, that. Yeah, there you go. I resemble that. There you go. So, so yes, um, I am the founder, president, and chief strategist of Kid Glove. We are a boutique, full-service marketing, branding, and advertising agency, and we really focus on serving those who are doing good in the world. As a matter of fact, our official purpose statement is putting a megaphone in front of those who are doing good in the world. So hmm. we work for a lot of nonprofits. We work for public health and social impact movements. We work for other B Corps. Um, interestingly, we work for credit unions and community banks because they do a lot of good in their communities as well. So that's where our work is. And, and we do everything from branding to creating a brand, refreshing a brand, to websites, to campaigns, to public relations, the whole gamut of marketing and advertising things. So that that's what fantastic. we do. Yes. Yes. That is awesome. And I have to say, you know, as someone, both, both Bruce and I have had experience either being on boards or working for nonprofits in the past. And the, the attachment to a mission that yes. you know really resonates with community and with just putting good into the world um, is so great, and it's easy, I think, for yeah. um, for people to be motivated to work for organizations that have that. And I, I'm always a big fan of thinking that even in the public sector, the profit side of the world, that they should uh, be thinking that way anyway, <laughs> not yeah. just dollars. So. I'm I'm curious, Lynn, what inspired you to do this work? What what was the that seminal moment that you just went, you know what? This is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. Um, so um I've always been a creative person. You know, I was that kid, I was that kid in high school that was in the art club and the drama club and the writing club. And I just, I don't know if it's I didn't have the courage, I didn't have the confidence, I didn't see the pathway to go and be a professional artist or to be a professional actor. For a hot minute, I told my parents I wanted to major, major, major in theater in college and they very quickly talked me out of it. I know you guys are theater people too, right? So uh, when somebody introduced me to advertising as an opportunity for a career, it was perfection because it was the the great blend of using creativity to do business so it it hit all of my hot buttons and it made my parents happy as well because it did seem like a more respectable profession than acting what? <laughs> i could have been the next meryl streep though you know like i think See? i could have been if you guys need me to i could cry right now i could I, make myself cry make yes <laughs> 
Well, let's keep it light. Yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right, our, right, right. The All Crying Podcast is not our podcast. No. All right, all right. <laughs> Actually, Gail, I want to lean into something you said too. Um, I, you know, when you think about the principles that nonprofits have and think about working with for the for-profit world and bringing some of that mission and purpose to the for-profit world, that's really what I think the B Corp movement is, right? So in order to be a certified B Corp, you have to pass rigorous standards uh, that demonstrate you take care of your employees, you take care of the environment, you give back to the community, you have a good uh, like governance system for your organization. So it does really feel like it's bringing that purpose into the for-profit world too. And sometimes people will say to me, um, is being a B Corp and focusing on those things, making it more difficult for you to make a profit? And the answer is no, because mm -hmm. there's all kinds of data that shows if you take care of your employees, they will stay longer because it's expensive to replace employees. If you take care of the environment, you'll keep yourself out of trouble, right? If you take care of your community, you'll have support from those around you. And if you take care of the governance and management of your organization, that also is gonna lead to good things. It's just a good common sense business practice. So all yeah. of those things really work together. Yeah, they do. And I think you hit the nail on the head because there's a big movement, uh, especially in the Gen Y and Gen Z yes. populations yes. where they are incredibly discerning about how they spend their money <clears throat> and they yes. know about the organizations and how they're structured and what they invest in and, 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 um, and what they care about. And so that makes so a huge much difference. Good data. Yeah. Are, are there a couple of organizations that you're excited to, to work with that you could highlight right now that, that may be out there that just, I'm not going to say your favorite because that's unfair. Oh, uh, maybe I know. just ones that it's... come to, to top of mind oh, that you're like, goodness. oh, yeah. Well, um, company. Yeah. All right. Gosh, that is so hard. And, and you know how it is when somebody asks you that question and you're like, you go blank because it's like, mm. I don't know, which one do I pick? <laughs> um, I am going to mention you all are in Colorado. One of my favorite for profits is a company called Copiece that we get to work with. Actually, I know you get to work with Craig and the Copiece team as well. They work with <laughs> us. We work with them. But you know, they're all about social impact investing and helping business be a force for good. So uh, I had a call yesterday with Craig and his team, and so we always like working with those guys at mm. Copiece. And then just because it's at the very top of my mind, we've launched a couple of uh, new brands recently, but one for um, a really fantastic um, nonprofit that serves people in the space of addiction recovery, which is tough, tough place to be in, right? And uh, we rebranded them. They were called Women's Empowering Lifeline, which is, you know, a fine name, until they decided to acquire a men's program. And then it was no longer appropriate. So uh, we were able to rebrand them to the well and build this beautiful brand identity for them that was a blend of strength and acceptance and it incorporated trauma-informed colors and wow. you know this beautiful language of empowerment and, and meeting people where they're at. Um, I mean, one of the keys to nonprofit and human service branding that agencies may not realize if they're not in this space is you always need to make sure when you're working with a human service organization that you don't re-stigmatize the audience that's coming in for support, right? You hmm. you yeah. always want the feeling to be good for, for the donors, for the um, the stakeholders, for those who are, are being served. That's so true. Wow. I love that. I love also that, you know, you touched on something that I bet a lot of people don't even really think about something that you said about trauma informed colors, you know, trauma informed I colors, people, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't really think about that. They don't think, you know, 
the intention for choosing colors or working on brand has always been there. I just think that the scope of what you include in that intention is is broadening, right? Hmm. And it yeah. should. You so guys know you just went through. Yeah, you just went through a rebrand yourself. It's a yeah. it's a big thing to do, but you know, I liken it to I, I like to say that um marketing with a poor brand is like wearing sweatpants to a job interview, right? Like <laughs> You know, we all dress up, we get the new haircut, we, you know, I put on a little extra lipstick today for this call. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Because you want to make a great first impression and your brand goes out in he ahead of your work and makes that impression for you. Your brand tells people if you are sensitive or buttoned up or fun loving or you know, all of those things, that brand goes out ahead of you and creates that first impression. I love that. Hmm. I love that. That's great. When you think about your industry, specifically in the marketing world, um, what are you seeing as far as challenges uh, in industry hmm. right now? Oh, challenges in the industry. Well, um, you know, we're going into a time of a little bit of a tumultuous economy, right? I, I don't know if you guys are feeling it. We're feeling it a little bit. Um, and some, you know, one of the jokes is accounting is always the, or accounting, marketing is always the first thing to get cut. I think accounting's kind of in there too, but marketing's always the first thing to get cut. And what's crazy about that is, you know, I think Henry Ford said this, cutting your marketing to save money is like throwing away your clock to save time, right? Like mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for organizations to make headway if their competitors are being quiet. So, but yeah, tumultuous economy is always, you know, makes a lot of us small business owners a little bit nervous. So here's another question is, how are you seeing AI impacting your, your company and, and your future? Oh my goodness. So uh, AI is like a huge hot topic. And I actually talked to a high school student who was thinking about going into advertising. And she said, do you think they'll actually even be working advertising or will AI take over the whole industry? And I was like, that, that made me so sad. AI is a great tool and we are, we are fully embracing it as a tool to save time on certain tasks. You know, like one of our favorite tools is um, now in Adobe Creative Suite. If I've got a picture of somebody that's an original photograph and I wanna change the person's sweater to match the brand color of the client's logo, I can do that really quickly in AI mm -hmm. right now. So that kind of thing, it's, great for it. It helps us with proofreading and some things, some research, although you have to be very careful right now still in making sure you're getting accurate information or you're getting the proofreading prompts that actually fit your brand. But AI by its nature is learning quickly. It's regurgitating things back to us. AI is not capable of coming up with original ideas. And I believe that people come to marketing, branding, and advertising agencies because they are looking for original ideas. I think one of the misnomers is I keep hearing people say, oh, I had AI write all my social media. I had AI write my employee manual. And on the surface, you're like, wow, that's great. But when you go in and you read it, it's kind of gobbledygook, right? Like it's, uh, so you, you have to, you have to be careful with it. So we'll continue to, we'll con investigate AI. I think everybody on my team has access to it and uses it, but it's not the end product. It's something that supports us in getting to the end product. So the other thing I'd love to know is because you know Bruce and I are in a business where we are passionate and passionately working toward uh, helping people become closer to their colleagues and their clients, oh, yeah. deepen those relationships, communicate better, um, have higher emotional yeah. intelligence. 
what are some of some people call them soft skills uh yeah we call them power skills what are some of those power skills that you are seeing whether it's you know, when you meet with different clients, when you're out in the world today, or even um, just among different generations that you think is kind of missing um, or really yeah. valuable and needs, needs to be nurtured. Gail, I thought you might ask me this because I've heard you ask it on other episodes. And so I was thinking about it and I have two, and maybe you can help me lean into if we want to talk more about either of these. But if you think about the advertising and marketing industry, I love how you lean in, you guys. If you think about this industry, we're taking a lot of creative idea people and we're putting them in an ultra competitive environment. And it's kind of like a pressure cooker of chaos, right? Like it's just like everything going on. We're all nonconformists. We're all coming up with the new ideas. So the things that I see missing, and, and I have to admit, they're things that I've had to work on personally. Uh, the first is balance. Um, and I don't know if people think of balance as a soft skill, but it is really easy in this industry to get into a pattern of, I'm just going to keep like, I'm just going to keep working this and working this and working this. I'm going to, I think our industry pulls like a lot of all nighters. Uh, the, the more I can put into this, the better. And because of that, then it leads to a lot of burnout and stress, right? As a matter of fact, there is a point of diminishing returns where you can no, no longer be creative because your brain's just kind of locked up, right? So I think balance is one that's missing. I think the other one that we lose sometimes is authenticity because the whole business is about transforming what you want to say into what your audience wants to hear. And so it's hard for, it's hard not to have some of that wash off on yourself, right? Like, oh, I'm going to go into this meeting and I'm going to kind of pretend I'm a little bit different person than I am. Mm. Um, and I, I think tapping into that authenticity, I think that is a power skill. I love that. And, I, you know, you just made me think of something uh, specifically that we we've worked on with different clients, and that is kind of a sensitivity to the various kind of complex personalities around you um, and that. Yeah with awareness of other people's personalities, their values, the qualities that they kind of exhibit in the way that they move through time, space, and work. Uh, if yeah. you are sensitive to that, you can show up in a different way and it still can be authentic to you. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a disorganized kind of gal. Bruce can attest. I'm like, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't Bruce really is rolling his eyes. Him. I don't know if you can see him, Gail. Bruce no is rolling comment, his eyes. <laughs> no comment at all. I can feel it. I I don't love filing. I don't love analytics and data and all of that kind of stuff. Just heavy, heavy um, kind of strategic work. It it yeah. uh, is difficult for me uh, from from my own kind of personality, the, the, the person I am, um, and yet. I can appreciate and understand that for other people, that's a place from which they launch. Like if they've got the foundation of all of that, then everything else can fall into place and make sense. So I can show up for someone like Bruce who needs the data, needs kind of more of a strategy, like a full picture of something prepared in a way for him that allows us to have a better interaction and still be me while I'm doing it. Um, that doesn't make me yeah. inauthentic. It makes me aware and sensitive and able to self-manage and be socially aware to his needs. And I think, so you've hit the nail on the head. There's, there's kind of a balance of be you and, and able to show up for others as, as you may need yeah. to, to get the, the work done. Right. Um, I, so, I, that point. is so good. Like when I think about our industry, you know, I hate the show Mad Men and everybody always asks me about Mad Men. Um, and it kind of paints the picture of the perfect advertising person as somebody who can come up with ideas and present them with great flair. And yes, that 
personality is very important, but it's not the only personality that's important, right? We, we also need people that are deeply thoughtful and ask questions. We also need people who are amazingly supportive and helpful. We also need people who can just get the things done, like transfer the ideas into the to-do list and make sure it all happens. We need all of those personality types in our business. But I think where I've come to in recent years is to stop trying to take somebody who's not in a certain box and train them to do well in that certain box, right? Like embrace the skill set someone has and then surround them with people because we do our work in teams, surround them with people who have the complementary skill sets. We actually have a Slack channel um, that's called Help I'm Frustrated. And it's not a venting Slack channel. It's a Slack channel that's like, hey, if I've got an afternoon wor worth of detail work, but yet I'm an idea person, that's going to be the worst thing ever to me. I'm going to dread it. I'm going to procrastinate it. I'm probably going to stretch it out and take more time. So if I can say, help, I'm frustrated. I got this list of to-do things. And somebody else goes, help, I'm frustrated. I have this list of like big picture thinking and that's not where I live. You guys switch and everybody's happier. The work gets done better and more quickly, right? And so that's, it's a new kind of development for us to be thinking about this. And it takes some coaxing. I mean, going back to the skill of authenticity, it takes some coaxing to convince people to admit they have something that they're not great at and to say, stop trying to get better at that. Instead, stay in your lane, stay in your flow. And, you know, we all have stuff we have to do. Like, you can't just say, oh, I don't want to do anything. But we kind of use this guideline of, hey, if you're in that frustration for an hour, put your head down and do it. If you're in it for a half a day, raise your hand and find, find some help. If you are in it for a week, like put on the sirens, wave your arms, like get your megaphone out, let us know and we'll we'll flip that out. So we're we're working on it. We're not perfect at it by any means, but it's something we're working on. You're so an interesting thing is I actually had uh, some feedback given to me when when I was a younger consultant. So this was probably 24, 23 years, a, a while ago. Let's just say a, a while ago. A year or two was, ago, a year or two yeah, ago. Yeah, exactly. It was a question of authenticity <laughs> and it was one of those things that really confused me. Um, the, my manager told me to quit trying to be the funniest person in the room, which made me have to really step back and go, okay, so what is the perception of me and, and why is that happening? And then, and then how much should I change my personality to reflect what he was asking me to do. And yeah. uh, I mistakenly made the change and realized later that I shouldn't, just like Aww. this guy who's making the change to not bark right now. And he really, really <laughs> wants to bark. That's, uh, that's what he's Everything doing. is better with a puppy. That is a rule of that's advertising. Right. So right. bring him on in. <laughs> so our last <laughs> question for you, Lynn, is what is the best piece of advice you have ever been given. So it could have been ah. at, at the beginning of the, your, your career. It could have been yesterday. But what has really stuck with you as something that you think, wow, that was extremely useful to know and let me change the way I am as a, as a leader, as a person, etc. Wow. I've had a few years to collect advice here. So that's a tough one. But um, <laughs> I think one of my favorites uh, that probably helped me when I started Kid Glove, helped me when I started my own podcast, helped me when, you know, we did different things is anything worth doing is worth starting ugly. And uh, what that means to me is that uh, it means that don't wait for perfect to get started. Like, I would never advocate for being sloppy or not working hard or not being prepared. But I think a lot of times we really get hung up on 
I can't talk about this. I can't do it. I can't think it until it's perfect. But sometimes you just got to get out there and do it. Right. So yeah. that's I think that's a good one. If I were going to add the second best, it's never say anything you wouldn't want written on the wall behind your head, right? Like really be careful. And, and so today that even means like not just what you say verbally, but what you put in an email, what you put in a text, what you put in a direct message to somebody, but really watch, watch those words. Yeah. I would even take it a step further and, and cause this is something I'm working on, uh, your internal talk, your self-talk as well. Oh, yes, because... Gail. Wow, that's a whole episode right there. Isn't right? It? <laughs> it's amazing to me. Like I I can tell you, I think it's really fascinating when something goes wrong and and people and and I I'm kind of strange in that I um I speak out loud to myself a lot. And when I do and something breaks down, oftentimes I say something that was said to me by a parent or a, you know, a relative. And I realized like, oh, that's horrible self-talk. Like you're not an idiot yeah. or you're not stupid or you don't need to say, come on, Gail, that's ridiculous. You know, whatever it is that yeah, I really like right. that. Yeah. Be I gentle really like to that. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, awesome. Good. That Last is really good question. advice. Well, thank you. Um, you too. Uh, <laughs> last quick question. Um, what are you excited about right now? What is inspiring you and getting you, you know, putting a smile on your face? You have the best questions. Um, so this <laughs> podcast is one of them, right? I love, hey. I love listening to you guys and such an honor to be a guest, of course. Um, I really like the idea of advertising and marketing is a force for good, right? Like I think that for profits and nonprofits have an opportunity to lean into equity and inclusion. We have an opportunity to um, use our megaphone as a force for change. You know, I think sometimes this industry gets the perception of, you know, selling things to people that they don't need. But in actuality, you know, there's a lot of good that can come from this work as well. And so that really, really excites me. I love that. Mm. I love that. Lynn, you are spectacular. You and your team are Aww. doing great work. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming in and chatting yes, with us for a little while. It is a pleasure for us. As always. Take care. All right. I can't wait to see you in person. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah.